there's two things I want to talk about. One is how I hope to change the culture of research in my field of ophthalmology. And the other is I want to convince you that that's a totally natural desire for a 25-year-old that's grown up here at Case in Cleveland to have. So let's start by talking a little bit about the classic way that research has been done. It starts with an idea. And then once you have that idea, if you're an academic, you apply for a grant. And once you have the funds from a grant, you could start collecting data. And once you have your data collected, you have your final data set, and you could publish a paper or speak at a conference and really make your name out there in the academic community. In fact, anyone who's in academia will have at one point heard the expression, publish or perish. But I want to explain to you that this isn't just some process. This is medicine. This is how we know how to treat our patients. You know, we know which medications to give because of the data that's been collected at these trials. Right now, my 90-year-old grandfather is going through chemotherapy, and we know which drugs are going to give him the best probability of surviving his cancer because of this process. So you can imagine with a benefit like that how enormously complex it is to go through all this. It's really difficult to come up with a good idea, as Tom Benson explained to us at the beginning of today. It's more difficult even to get a grant for your idea. You need an institution like a Case Western behind you, and you need resources to be able to put a grant application together. So there's a lot more people with good ideas than there are with the funds to support them, and that's really important. There's a lot more people with good ideas than there are people with the resources to put them together. And then if you are so lucky as to get a grant, you then have to go into data collection, which requires two things, patience and patience. It requires patience to sign up for a clinical trial. People volunteer to enter this. They volunteer to say, you know what, I'll take the chance that I might receive a placebo instead of a medication that's going to help me in order to advance our scientific knowledge. That's incredible. And having been here in Cleveland for a while, I'm really impressed with how many people volunteer for clinical trials. That's a debt that we really can't repay our patients, especially the ones that have passed away during these trials. The second type of patients is that these trials take years to do. We just finished one of the largest studies in ophthalmology, the CAT trial, where we compared two medications in ophthalmology to see which was better for treating a disease that we talked about a little bit earlier today, macular degeneration. And this study, by the way, was led right down the street here at the Cleveland Clinic. And what did we find by the end of that trial? Well, the two drugs look pretty good. But by the time it's taken to collect the data, a third medication's actually been developed. So what's happened? If the time it takes to do a clinical trial remains constant, and it does, but our pace of medical innovation is accelerating, and it has been, there's going to come a point where we're putting out drugs faster than we could put them through clinical trials. And in my field of ophthalmology, we're pretty much there. And if we're not there yet, we're going to be there soon. So after you go through this whole process, then you have your data. And that's key. That, that is the goal. You know, I think data should be considered as much a product of the publicly funded research process as publications and conference proceedings, and should be distributed just as widely. And the reason why it should is because so much benefit could come of it. There's so many good ideas, so many great grants, and so many great scientists that get left on the cutting room floor that could possibly be picked up if we had the data to support them. And we do have that data, but it's not distributed. It's Excel tables that are sitting on people's hard drive well after their studies have finished. We just haven't had this culture yet. This is the traditional way of doing things. And I want to convince you that what we need is the raw data now. We need the data to be freed from the hard drives, and we need it to be accessible so people can use it. There's a lot of reasons and a lot of pros that could come out of that. When people ask, who's really going to use this? You know, how are you actually going to put this to use? How is someone going to take an Excel table and then help patients get better treatment? I want to explain how in three ways. Three S's. Silos, secondary analysis, and synergy. What do I mean by silos? I think right now in research, sometimes we work in institutional silos. You know, if you're at one institution or one university, you're going to focus on what's at your place, what's popular in your institution. But you might not focus on other ones. Furthermore, if you're not an upper-tier place like Case Western that has all the resources that we have here in Cleveland, it's very difficult to get a grant application approved. So I think there's a lot of people that are in middle-tier institutions that don't have the same access to the resources that we have here, and their ideas are being left out. Furthermore, if you are an upper-tier institution, 
I worry that sometimes you're not collaborating as much with other upper tier institutions or middle tier institutions as you should be. We're very lucky to have two great hospital systems and they're right down the street from each other. I hope they're maximizing their collaboration to enhance patient care. I think we also have silos in different fields. You know, somebody who's a retina guy might not be collaborating with somebody who treats the front of the eye and the cornea. Or in my personal case, I was an undergraduate economics major. And I remember when I started, everybody would say to me, you're going to be a doctor, why are you studying economics? Nobody asked that to me anymore. You know, times have changed and healthcare costs are becoming increasingly important for better or worse. So I think we need to collaborate between fields, different fields of expertise. We need to break through out of our silos. Reason number two, secondary analysis. What is secondary analysis? It's going through the process that we just described earlier, but backwards. It's starting with the data and then coming up with your hypothesis and using it in a way that wasn't originally intended. <clears throat> so for instance, I got to be part of a Weatherhead initiative that was formed with the Cleveland Clinic, the Cleveland Clinic Healthcare Management Scholars Program. It gave us access to a database of 409,000 patient records that a lot of different hospitals from all over the country came together to make and collaborate with one another. And when that data was collected, every variable and every patient, they didn't know what it would be used for at the time. Nobody intended for us to study post-operative complications, but we were able to do that. And a lot of other studies have been able to do that. Not just post-operative complications, but study many things from one database. So they're going through the process backwards, which means they're not being hindered by the same roadblocks. We're getting more bang for our grant dollars. And when research is being cut by the national budget, it's really important to do that. So we really need to focus on secondary analysis and getting the most out of what we have. The third S, synergy. Right now, one data set is kept separate from another data set, especially if there are different institutions. It's hard to link one data set's information to another one and then create a bigger whole. You know, there's a, a paper that just came out in the archives of dermatology where somebody looked at a data set from the CDC that showed the distribution of dermatologists and another data set from the National Cancer Registry of fatal melanoma cases. And taking those two data sets together, they said, look, we're having a lot more cases of fatal melanoma, a disease that can be treated with a simple in-office procedure in areas where we don't have as many dermatologists. And because they're able to make that powerful policy statement, their argument has gotten wings, and the US News picked it up. And that's really using secondary analysis and synergies between data sets. And for me, my favorite part of that study, it was actually done by a classmate of mine a 25-year-old classmate of mine, along with her younger brother. You know, you're really bringing in a new group of people into the research fold when you make the data available. So people wonder, is there a demand for this? Are people gonna put up their data? You know, in science and research, we have a culture of privacy around our information, which is important sometimes. But we deal with redacted information already when we collaborate with different organizations. So I used to have a chemistry professor, and he would always ask us, is this reaction possible? Because we didn't know all that much chemistry in our freshman year. And then he would put up a reaction where that principle was demonstrated, and he would look at us and say, well, if it exists, then it must be possible. Databases that link different data sets together in fields already exist. And they exist in astronomy. And they exist in something called dbGaP, the database of genotype and phenotype. The field of genomics has gotten together and decided that they're going to upload all of their raw data for each other to use. And the projects that have come out of this have been fantastic. So other fields are already doing this. This is not a paradigm shift, it's a change in culture. We need to jump on that wagon and accelerate. And I realized if you want to put a project like this together, you're going to really have to have some dream influences along the way. You're going to have to talk to the right people that give you good ideas to say how this should be done. And I thought, you know, if I could talk to anybody about this, who would I talk to? And I said, well, I'd probably talk to the head of the National Eye Institute, the ophthalmology branch of NIH. And guess what? She was right here at Case Western talking to a group, Case for Sight, an undergraduate group, about advancing research. And she said to me, you know, when we did our famous clinical trial, the ARID study, which showed vitamins can reduce macular degeneration by 25%, we decided that we would put all our data online. And guess what? It was downloaded 96 times. That's 96 institutions that applied to download it, who went through an IRB process. That's fantastic. There's a demand out there. And then I thought, you know, who else would I love to talk to? I probably want to talk to somebody who's starting one of the largest clinical trials in ophthalmology. 
So I thought, okay, where can I find this person? And it was, again, right across the street, Case Western, Dr. Leas. He's starting on something called the Corneal Preservation Time Study, for which he got a $12.4 million grant. And I asked him, how are, how are you going to feel about putting your data online? And he looked at me and goes, we assume it's going to be publicly accessible from day one. You know, there's a demand, like we talked about with the three S's, and there's a supply to make this happen. And just a quick time out from my talk. Everything I've said so far has had a local tie-in. I hope you guys realize that we live in a great city. Not a good city, but like really a great city. You know, I, uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I, in my own institution, the medical school, there have been six Nobel Prizes given out since 1980 to case med alum, people that have spent their formative years right here in Cleveland. And I didn't know that. You know, I think sometimes we forget how good our local institutions really are. And we have to know how great they are, because I promise no one's going to think any better of our city than we believe it to be. So we're a great place, and don't forget it. And it's no wonder that somebody who spends their formative years here would want to do a project like this, and would meet the right people to have it succeed, hopefully. So I thought, okay, if I want this to succeed, what could we bring to the table? And I think we could bring standardization. In ophthalmology, we use a lot of the same variables, demographics, how well you can see. So we could link databases much more easily than maybe other studies could. It wouldn't be impossible to do this. In fact, other fields already have. So we could make that synergy happen. And I think what we could bring to the table is a platform, a centralized location. We could build the DB gap of ophthalmology. And we're going to do this. The last thing I think we bring to the table is that there's somewhat of a, of a new culture coming into medicine. I, I'm, I'm graduating medical school with a class of people that had laptops in their cribs. You know, it's, a patient looked at me, he must have been 80-something years old, and he goes, you know, your generation just doesn't buy green bananas. And we don't buy green bananas. We want to make things happen, and we want to make things happen now. And I think these structural changes are going to keep coming to research. So I hope to accelerate that. Lastly, because I, I've had all these great experiences at CASE, other organizations have been interested in working with me. And one of them was Orbis International. They're a group that turned an airplane into an eye hospital. And it's awesome. I mean, it is as great as it sounds. They fly around to developing countries and spend three weeks there and train ophthalmologists on newer procedures. I went with them to Myanmar, which is a country that doesn't have free access to the internet. It was rated as having the second worst freedom of the press after North Korea. And I was talking to ophthalmologists there, and I said, how do you learn these materials? You don't have the books that we have at home, but where are you getting access to know what you know? I said, oh, well, we go to the coffee shop, which VPNs outside the government firewall, and we read about it. I was like, OK. And then when I was in Vietnam, I talked to a doctor there, and I said, how do you get this information? He said, well, you know, I use Orbis's website. They have so many textbooks uploaded there, and I really appreciate it. But by the way, can you put up the newest edition of this one? And I was like, this is exactly how things should be. Times are changing, and a whole new group of people are coming online. In 2010, 23% of the world's population has internet access. By 2020, 60-some percent, 66 percent exact. This was presented at TED just a couple months ago. That means 3 billion new people are coming online. How many new scientists are there? How many new ideas are we going to have that I hope don't get left on the cutting room floor? It's important that we make our data available to bring everyone online into the research community. Lastly, if you want to make something, you better start right away. You have to launch. And we're launching next week, Friday, April 27th. I'm so excited for it. This is a real, tangible project. It's happening. And I really have to thank my partner on it, Krishna Surapaneni, who has made it happen start to end. Also a case student. So what is this project really about? You know, this is really about new people coming online and wanting to be part of a bigger community. It's about people who want to share their research ideas and give others the power to share their ideas as well. And when I thought about that, to me, that's exactly what TEDx is about. You know, it was so perfect that I got to give this talk here, where we have a vibrant community of people that want to share their ideas. You know, I, I think my project, I'm so proud of it, and I really hope it happens. But I don't think it's unique in the whole of Cleveland, in the whole of this audience here at TEDx. So thanks a lot for making TEDx happen. 
It really, the medium is the message. We sold out in like a half hour, 700 tickets. I'm looking forward to meeting people later, and thank you for listening. <laughs>